This is Jim and Debbie from Gamers Rule, and you're listening to Roll for Initiative. That's a very good thing, you know. D20 Radio, your gamers roll. www.d20radio.com. Roll for Initiative. Back to the Roll for Initiative podcast, uh, issue number twenty-eight. We're almost thirty years old, guys. You believe that? Well, issues thirty years old. <laughs> thirty issues old. Thirty issues I wish old. I, I wish I was twenty-eight again. Yeah. So we're back. A little. Sh- I was an idiot at twenty-eight, or more of one. I don't need to go backwards. <laughs> yeah. We all were idiots at twenty-eight. <laughs> if you're just stepping into this podcast for the first time, this is the Roll for Initiative podcast. The only podcast dedicated to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons First Edition. I am one of your hosts, DM Vince. We're along with DM Jason. Jason, say hello to everybody. Hello to everybody. <laughs> Nick, you can <laughs> do the same. Hello to everybody. How uh, are you? <laughs> and we have two comedians here with us today, folks. Anyway, let's wow. um, <laughs> let's step right into the nitty gritty, and uh, let's talk about our website, RFI Podcast. No, RFI.com. <laughs> dot com. Wow, I was thinking of the email address. <laughs> RFIpodcast.com. That's right. Where there is a new, where there's an where there's a new uh, <laughs> article up right now. Yes. The ecology of the what is it, Nick? Mantari. The Mantari. Yeah. So monster the new, from the Fiend Folio. Every week you can go to our site and see a new plus two to save article from Todd Hughes, and this week is the ecology of the, the... No, the Mantari. <laughs> what was that about? I couldn't remember. Oh, okay. His brain locked up, too. Yeah. yeah. That's because we're getting old, right? Uh, yep. I don't know. This is the youngest I'm ever going to be, so let's get started. My hair is yeah. white. My teeth are gray. And TMI again, Nick. Um, so what did you do this week for as far as uh, gaming-wise? You guys do anything? or? Well, uh, we're getting actually set up right now to start a couple of new campaigns. So one in person and one online. Mm-hmm. The uh, the online Skype game, we've got about uh, seven different listeners from the RFI podcast. Uh, what, nation? Civilians? Citizens of R- RFI? <laughs> the RFI uh, Army? Who? That's yeah. it. RFI S- Army. Sub- subjects of the Kingdom? I don't know. Wow. Uh, <laughs> comrades in Arms, something like that. Ruth so, uh, Red Shirts? We, yeah. Oh. Well, I hope not Red Shirts, because we need them to <laughs> make it through the first module. Yeah, uh, Yeah. so we're going to start that next week. We're just getting into character creation right now, and I'm just uh, you know building up the world for that. So it's anticipation. Any any hints or tidbits about the campaign you want to give away or no? No, uh, <laughs> partially because I don't want to give away anything to the uh, players and partially because I'm still figuring it out. But I... Uh, I will tell you this. We are literally going to be hitting the ground running on the first one. I've got a, I'll tell you how we started out the first uh, adventure after we do it next week. But I've got a fun way to get started. Okay, great. Cool. And, and, and this, okay. I know you're running one too. So, well, I was going to ask you. One, one, I wanted to ask you about your when your start, so everybody gets an idea. Oh yeah, yeah. So it starts it starts next Wednesday. We're going to play every Wednesday night. We are August recording it. I 25th? don't know. Fifth. The twenty fifth. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if we're going to actually uh, put any of the play up because I know you, you've got yours and maybe that's too much. And we'll see how it goes. Um, but it might yeah. be worth it because it'll probably be a little different because in our uh, game, we're going to be playing very by the book. We're going to be using um, armor class adjustments, Ooh. encumbrance, uh, pummel grapple rules, you know, the weaponless combat rules, um, all all kinds of uh, stuff like that. All kinds of nitpicking by the book stuff. Yes, I I'm love going it. to. I'm going to see if I can show that you can play uh, with all those by the book rules and keep the action moving fast and furious. And ah, fun. ah, but I have one question for you. What's that? Are you going What's to that? use Saya? No, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he got you on that one. <laughs> I knew you were going no psionics. No, I. <laughs> yeah, e- even if we wander into Gamma World, no psionics. All right. Ah. Uh. That's for another show. We'll talk about that. But how yes. about yours? Uh, mine is uh, four. I have four players from our listeners that are from Facebook, 
and two external, but I'm going to be taking some more players just in case as backups, in case someone wants to back out and they can't make it. So, But uh, it's going to be starting on September 2nd, which is Saturday between 2 and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Wow, it's, Labor Day weekend. Is it Labor Day weekend? Maybe I'll have to start. I on, think so. Is it? I, I may have to start another weekend because some people might be away. So we'll, I'll discuss it with them. I'll email them personally and we'll chat about it. I was going to start it next weekend, but I got Betacon to go to. So Cool. What oh. is Betacon? It's a local PA uh, convention for uh, this side of the state that happens mm-hmm. uh, once a year. So Can people still sign up to go? Uh, yeah, you can you can walk into the door and buy a ticket if you want. It's 15 bucks. It's that cheap. Oh, not bad at all. Well, anybody who's in this neck of the woods, check it out. And we got, yeah. uh, in November, we got Mepicon, the big convention for Pennsylvania that probably three, four, five hundred 500 people show up to. I mean, it's not as big as Gen Con, but it's still big for PA. That's pretty good size for a local con. You get around three to 500 people. Yeah. It's a pretty good crowd. The guys from uh, Dead Game Society said they might come down. Check nice. it out. I was trying oh, to it's... I was trying to bribe Jason to come down, but he said he was busy doing low tech con. Yeah, I was going to say. Speaking of cons, uh, we have heard back from a couple of people who seem to like the idea, so I haven't given up on it yet. You haven't backed out yet? <laughs> nope. It's been a whole week, and I haven't backed out. Oh, anyway, Sweet. so about my campaign, you were asked. I'm sorry, but I ran around that whole question. Yeah, how are you going to run it? What's up? Uh, mine is obviously you no. Know, my style is a lot different than yours. I'm not by the book. I don't use weapon speeds or armor class adjustments. I'm just going to do it and have fun with it, and it's going to be a great campaign. Cool. So yeah, maybe we will. You know, at least put up oh, one and- of each or something. Mine's going to be recorded and and released on a different feed than our FI because we don't want to annoy people with uh, actual. Because a lot of people don't want to hear that. Right, so we'll put stuff up on the website and on the Facebook page. Anybody yeah. who wants to listen, there will be instructions on how to get that. Yeah, that'll be a separate feed. You want it, you get it. If you don't, don't worry about it. No no one will take offense to it. But mine will be like a weekly feature, putting up episodes and seeing how that goes for how long it goes. Very also, cool. uh, actually, since you bring that up, um, yeah. any listeners who use the RFI podcast um, iPhone app, Yes. It currently only has the ability to keep a single feed in it. So, uh, you know, let us know if you feel left out because we're not putting the live play into that and we'll find a way to put it in. But oh. I don't want to, uh, yeah. to what you just said, I don't want to block up people's uh, yeah, so stuff. It, 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 we'll get our tinker yeah. gnomes on, this, on that as soon as oh, possible. Great. Yeah. Well, they'll break it then. <laughs> All right, so we'll head into uh, Sage Advice next. Uh, hey, oh, okay. Oh, you want to say something, Nick? Well, you know, I mean, uh, as far as gaming is concerned, yeah. Well, we don't, we don't gotta... care. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, Nick. I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize, yeah, yeah, buddy. You know, there's another one here who, who does gaming, too. Oh, wait, there's Nick here? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just a Jason um, and Vince show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go on, buddy. Uh, but anyway, uh... This Saturday got the uh, our regular game going back on again after a extended hiatus, the Quest for Bob, as we've been calling it. Quest for Bob. So we're looking for Bob. What but, about Bob? Uh, what about Bob? Yeah, what about Bob? But it's it's taking a very interesting turn. We're heading into places, literally places we never thought we'd go, and uh, what else? Uh, one thing I saw is I don't know how a lot of people out there have heard of it, but I have the whole series on VHS. Um, the company who made Record of Lotus War. Yeah, I love that. It's out on YouTube for anybody to see now. It's, oh. What is so, it? I don't even know it. What the is Record it? of Lotus. It was uh, a Japanese Record, yeah. a Japanese Record. animation of Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. So, well, it's supposed to be... They couldn't get the legal rights to actually call it Dungeons and Dragons, so they made up their own world based off of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, pretty much. Yeah, really? That's, yeah, essentially, really good. The, the whole story is based off of somebody's D&D campaign. Yeah. So, highly recommend I highly Jason. recommend watching it. Yeah. It's really fun. Alright, so we'll put that one in the show notes, how to go and see that on YouTube. We'll put those up. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And sadly, I gotta, sadly, you and can't I buy that for some like, reason. Yeah. Oh no, that's okay. I just also had one other really awesome idea. I've been kind of not DMing for a few months now, but I just got a really cool idea from somebody off of dragonsfoot.org for a campaign idea. And I asked him, like, dude, that's, like, perfect. Can I use that? And 
I don't want to say anything else about it, but I'm I'm completely jazzed about it, and I just can't wait to get started on it. Probably this fall. So. All right. Yeah. Cool. Sounds sounds awesome. Is it going to be uh, your local group? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be my local gaming group. They have no idea what's going to be in store. It's going to be a major twist where they think things are going to be. So I'm yeah. really excited about it. Have to keep us updated on this. Oh, yeah. It's going to be very cool. All right. Sage advice. Sage advice. So we Sage. had we had a really interesting first letter. I'm sorry, Nick, were you saying something? He was uh, just, singing along as well. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> Sage advice. No That's more. Fine. All right. <laughs> sorry. sorry, Jason. My ears. My poor ears. We actually had our first email, which I forwarded to you, Jason. It was kind of interesting, so I wanted you to actually read it, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. You know what? Actually, I... Uh... Let me make sure I'm looking at the right one here where Nick writes in, right? No, the Wombat one. Oh, the Wombat one. Okay, I actually have to pop over to that. Why don't you uh, go to Nick's first? All right, Nick, you sure. read the, the email from Nick. Yes. I wrote into myself because I'm schizophrenic. Okay. <laughs> now, another Nick, he writes in and says, I'm interested in listening to first edition actual play recordings slash podcasts. It's so interesting to hear how other DMs create their worlds and how other players play. I managed to find one on iTunes called Expedition to the Ancient Academy. And by the way, yeah, I've heard that one too. I was yeah. just looking that up because I was going to see if I could mention it because I've listened to it and I think it's kind of neat. Yeah, I want to listen to it too. I have some comments when you're done about that, so go ahead. Yeah, he says, do you know of any others? Your creature feature segments are the great teasers and I do enjoy them, but I'd also love to hear some dedicated actual play sessions. I know you are planning on running a Skype game. Will that be recorded and available for download? I'm not well, able to go. commit. Well, there we go. We just answered it in this show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not able to commit to a weekly game at this point, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who would enjoy listening to the gameplay. Thanks for the great show. I look forward to each issue, and I truly enjoyed last week's interview episode with Frank Metzer. Inspiring. And well, thank you, Nick. That was Nick. Thanks, Nick. Well, you're, wel you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So have you guys listened to the Expedition to Ancient Academy podcast? Uh, yes. You know what? I just wanted to mention one more really quickly that I think is a first edition. It's called Thistledown Actual Play. So, And it's pretty easy. Just go to thistledownap.com. And uh, I believe they're playing first edition. It's an actual play podcast. So just one more for you. I haven't listened to it, though. Okay. We'll have to check okay. that out and, you know, tell people about it next time when we come back. Yeah. Uh, Expedition... Have you listened to Expedition to Ancient Academy, Jason? Yes. I have, too. Pretty... They're... Yeah, they... it's pretty good. Uh, well, let's... the sound quality, you know, isn't mm. always top notch, but, you know, it's a bunch of people sitting around a table. And yeah. I've listened to it, and I found it really interesting just because... Like the writer was saying, you just it, it's nice to hear how other people run their games. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I enjoyed it. Cool. All right. So my opinions on Expedition to the Ancient Academy. I listened to all the episodes because it was basic D&D, &D, first of all. It's not actually yeah. first edition, which I don't care. I like basic D&D. &D. It's great. Uh, sure. And then suddenly out of nowhere, it became fourth edition D&D &D without explanation whatsoever. <laughs> really? It just they just jumped into the next what? episode was just like, okay guys, we're gathered up tonight and we'll be playing fourth edition. I'm like, why? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then it gets even better. Because then the next four after the, those four, they started playing Deadlands. <laughs> What's that? It's a Savage World game. It's a it's a sci fi horror western. Oh, oh cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just like with no explanation, they just kept jumping games, and they need to change their description. <laughs> well, okay, maybe they should change their description, but I gotta say, we do that in our gaming group. We have nights where we just pull out a different game, so I understand. Well, it, the know. expedition to the Ancient Academy, while Jason said the sound quality is not that great, but it's still interesting to listen to. Right, so if you're looking for first edition actual play, make sure you check which episode I guess you're listening to of theirs yeah. so you don't end up listening to what was it vampire space monsters from monkey deadlands <laughs> or deadlands real quick vampire space monkeys that'd be a cool game vampire <laughs> space monkeys 
Yeah, well, I won't even be. I, I've been getting into like you know buying all these games that I've never played before, and they're starting to Sounds pile like up. Sounds like a 50s B movie. Could be, yeah. Greasers so, from outer space, you know, something yeah. like that. by Ed so, Wood. Yeah. Oh, don't even get into that. Oh. Yeah. So, so yeah, you know, there's that, and of course, you'll have the first edition actual play coming right out of Roll for Initiative. So, there you go. Straight from the minds of whoever plays. Yep. All right. Next email uh, comes from Steve T, who wrote in and asked about a Dungeons and Dragons gray book. It's a colored gray book with the original Holmes cover on it, with an old TSR logo on the front cover, which was printed that way. But it also had a Wizards of the Coast logo in it, and it was edited by, I forgot the name, I think it was Steve Enns. Uh, what, which, which game is it? It's, uh, it's a mix mash of first edition and basic D&D put together. So, I've never heard of this. It's not an official. It's a fan work. It okay, looks, so I was going to say, this would be a question for Jim and Debbie. Yeah. Um, it looks like an official book, uh-huh. but it's just someone who decided to edit a bunch of rules together because he didn't even change any of the words. He just put a forward in for himself and did a mishmash editing of uh, OD&D, oh. Basic, and First Edition. Wow, that's interesting. Where did the uh, listener get this? He found it on foreshared.com. What's that? Uh, it's a sharing network of files and various other things. Oh, so he it wasn't even a printed thing. No. It was a download. It was a download. He went in there and he uh-huh, searched yeah. D&D and found Greybook. And I was like, dude, I think that's a fan work. Yeah, I mean, never rely on downloads for stuff. Yeah, but you he know, wanted if, us if to address it. Yeah, I mean, if you can't find a book and the only way to get it is to get a download of it, that's great. At least you have a chance to look at it. But th- who knows what people put in those things. Yeah. So, they could yeah. put, like, you know, Ooga Booga and that'd be an official rule. But in I will play vampire with Vampire Space Bats or something like that. It was Vampire Space Monsters from Monkey Island, actually. Oh, excuse uh, me. Sorry, yes. <laughs> follow my rules. Uh, <laughs> if, however, anybody does ever come across something that they think is a little bit uh, surprising or odd, or you want to know when something was made, or you just have a question about something weird, really go to game or something weird about TSR products. That is, go to gamers-rule.com. And uh, look for some contact info for Jim and Debbie because they really are the authorities. Well, they know the most when it comes to what's out there, and uh, they might be able to help you out. Or you can just go to us because you're listening to us. So, or if I yeah, staff and then I'll ask com. Jim and Debbie. <laughs> so I look smarter. You're not supposed to we'll give relay our... the message. Yeah, you're not supposed right. to give away our secrets, buddy. <laughs> All, All right. right, so uh, we got another message here that I've managed to find now uh, from Mark. Who says, uh, Jason, out of curiosity, did your friend named Wombat happen to live in Massachusetts and attend WPI in the 87 to 92 range? If so, then I know him too, small world. If not, what's the likelihood of two people who are both nicknamed Wombat? Love the podcast. Keep up the good work. Um, Probably is not him. (laughs) Uh, Just so you know, uh, his real name is Dan H., I won't give his last name, Mm -hmm. Uh, but Dan H. So if your friend is named Dan H., then let me know. But the thing is that he picked up that nickname in San Francisco somewhere around, I would say, 95 or so. Because, I mean, he may have gone to school in uh, Massachusetts at that time. He'd be the right age maybe to have uh, gone there, but I'm pretty sure he went to SF State. And uh, the odds, he basically was just uh, hyperactive, and a friend of ours thought that wombats were hyperactive, and so, <laughs> which I don't think they are, uh, and named him that. And, uh, but he's one of the most intelligent and creative and brilliant people you'll ever meet, so there you go. Uh, and the odds of two people both nicknamed Wombat, I would say, sounds like 100%. <laughs> yeah, obviously. So. All right. So, then, then, do you have any more uh, emails? If you want to email us, or if I staff at gmail dot com, or you can leave a. Oh, that's right, Jason. You had some comments yeah. from the website. Yeah. I, for, sorry, I apologize. Go ahead. Just one. Actually, I'm just going to pull up one because this is uh, pretty interesting. I like what this guy has to say. DM Remus uh, commented on. Uh, I don't know which, but it was on the website. <laughs> And he's, uh, I don't know which story he was commenting on, but it doesn't, you know, it was, it was actually way back. He was, he just went up and put a comment on issue 14, creating your own adventure. Oh, okay. but he just, but he just okay. made this comment. And, and, and we see this a lot. I really like it when people go and they comment on older shows. It means they're going back and catching up or that's how they're, you know, whatever. It's cool. They're taking the time to learn about us. 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we wanted the podcast to be, right? Something kind of like yeah. Spirit of the Old Dragon magazine, where just because it's old doesn't mean you don't go back and read it again or listen to it again. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, it's a good resource. And uh, yeah. he's talking about backstabs, and he says about the backstab. Right. That's actually the first four words of his comment. About the backstab. <laughs> okay. I've always preferred the version of the backstab found in the D&D rule cyclopedia. The backstab itself is not actually a literal backstab. It's actually more of a sucker punch that does more damage, not just because it's aimed at a vital point, but it's not being defended against. It's all about catching the target by surprise. I mean, think about it this way. A fighter knows where to hit someone, probably better than a thief would, but the fighter doesn't get extra damage because the fighter doesn't typically sucker punch someone. Also, the thief is well aware that he or she is not a frontliner and is not interested in an upfront fight, so the thief is going to do the next best thing, take someone out in one or two shots. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. familiar with the D&D rule cyclopedia, but um, uh, yeah, if that's the way that it goes there then he's making a pretty good argument for it. Yeah. Uh, it, it completely fits the idea of what is supposed to happen in a round. It doesn't fit the way that I would play it in my game, but I get his logic. The rules cyclopedia is based off of the mentor rules, the mentor box sets, the five that came out during the 80s. Yep, mm-hmm. yep that's it's, right. It's kind of a, like a re-editing add-on to it, but it's... all right. Without going too much into detail, I don't like it. It's too second edition for me feeling. That's okay, the end, that's well, the end of my comment. The one thing that kind of makes sense then, if that's what it's based on, is uh, you know Frank Menser said something at the auction at the Gen Con auction a couple of weeks ago. What did he say? Where he was talking about legendary adventures. Oh, okay. And uh, now that I'm starting to say this, this might actually not have been Frank. It might have been Tim Cask that said it. Whatever, I'm going to pretend it was Frank, and then somebody can tell me I got it wrong. <laughs> uh, no, actually, you can go listen to one of our little mini-podcasts, the little special dispatches we did, because I did actually record it and put it up on there. And he was talking about the first time that he ever came across Legendary Adventures. He didn't even know that uh, Gary Gygax had done it, and he just looked at it and said, wait a minute, and was, actually, maybe this was Frank, and he's looked at it and said, wait a minute, this is what we were always talking about back in the day, the kind of rules that would just be common sense. If you fall in the river, you don't do a bunch of weight tables. You just go, hey, if you're wearing chain mail and your pockets are full of gold and you're in the river, you're going to sink. Yeah. Common sense. Yeah, that's common sense. There you go. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of makes, yeah, it's kind of common sense on the thief's backstab, is that if you've got a minute worth of activity going on, and the thief gets in there and knows how to, you know, pull a sucker punch, then he doesn't have to be literally behind him. Just common sense. He got a sucker punch in. Yeah. So I don't play it that way, but I think that it's a good way to say it. Yeah, the, the rules in Psychopedia a lot of people like, some people don't. You all have your own opinion. Well, actually, let's hear what you have to think about it. So you can email us. Uh, was there another comment, Jason, or that was it? Nah, no, nah, it's good. Oh, okay. Well, why not call it Sucker Punch, then? Well, maybe he does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that... Okay, valid argument. Anyway, so let's uh, head over into the creature feature, which we can uh, talk about our tactics from last week. Creature, 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 creature. Nick, you're on the uh, you're on the podium again. Yeah, creature feature. So last week, you guys had a bit of a a combat with the Ankhag from mm-hmm. the Monster Manual. I think I pronounced that right. But if not, there, about... is a, there is actually a dragon number ninety three or something that tells yep. you how to pronounce things, so you can always check. I'll go with my spell checker in my brain for now. So Ankhag sounds good to me. Yeah, Ankhag sounds good. Um, so actually you guys did pretty well on that one. Um, well, we killed it. Yeah. You, yeah. You killed it. Yes. Cut the thing in two with a lightning bolt. That always works. All right. I got to ask you when we dropped down into the pit where there were the two tunnels, I webbed up one of the tunnels. Did right. that make any difference? Absolutely not. <laughs> ah. but it was a good plan, Jason. I liked it. Well, there could have been two. Yeah. I That's right. There could have been sucks. two, but there wasn't. So, <laughs> You so literally you chose go. you you chose the onkeg to be behind the one I didn't web, didn't you? No, actually, I randomly rolled it. Really? Um, Seriously, yeah. would have allowed the web to block the onkeg? Sure, huh. that's nice of you. Because that's how I roll. Uh, yes. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this creature. Yeah, um, it's going out of the monster manual. 
uh, it's a uh, large insect uh, type creature burrows to the earth like an earthworm it prefers to be in soil like around forests and um, um, agricultural land hence why when you cleared out through those hills they, they were in those farmlands Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. they told you that there was that strange creature that was making people disappear. They wouldn't be seen again, or if they were found, they were dead. Um, it, um, let's see, since its mouth is not designed to rip or tear meat, its mandibles crush its prey and secrete a digestive enzyme, Ooh. causing an additional one to four points of damage till the prey is completely dissolved. And so... Pretty hefty damage, even from the mandibles. Three to eighteen points of damage plus the one to four points per per uh, turn. Yeah. So, pretty nasty in itself. Um, also, it has the ability uh, once a day, I believe, to um, spit up digestive acid. Yeah, mm-hmm. I felt that. Which, yeah, you got yeah real close to that. Uh, that which can cause eight. To thirty-two points of damage if it hits. Yeah. So, and one of the things I like about this creature, right at the beginning of the book too, it's one. There is even a little brief description on like a little bit of a combat tactic for this thing in its description. It says the Ankhag's favorite method of attacking is lying five to ten feet underneath the ground until its antenna detects a likely victim passing overhead. Then it mm-hmm. burrows out directly underneath the prey and grabs it. So that's cool. A little bit of a tactic idea when using this thing. Yeah. Um, also, I found kind of interesting is uh, its hit dice are are ra- are variable. You can have a small one from three hit dice or to a you know big bad mama jama up to eight eight hit dice. So in this respect, this is a creature where you can use from low to probably mid-level, almost in what you might consider high-level play because of the range of hit dice this thing can um, that, that could be. And also it has two different armor classes, a little weird in that respect. Its underside has a lower, uh, has a worse armor class than its, the rest of its body. Its underside is uh, armor class 4 versus the rest of the body of 2. So depending on where you hit, you can randomly determine, I guess, by the GM. You know, and this is something I, again, with AD&D, where there wasn't a mechanic to figure this out. You just, it was up to the DM where you decide that, you know, where you hit, you know, did you get on top of the thing? Did you get on the bottom of the thing? So there's a little free form in that respect. I kind of like that. Were you playing it that way when we were going up against it? Um, I kind of left it to a random roll, fifty-fifty chance. You hear it in the top okay. or the bottom of the thing. So okay. I left completely up to the dice to decide where you hit. Yeah, so. I think I would definitely allow a, a called shot in this case because you know players like to say, "Can I go for the soft underbelly or whatever?" And oh, sure, this is a good opportunity to do that. I don't know if I would give it a fifty-fifty chance since it probably would be smart enough not to expose yeah. its unplated areas. It'd too probably, often. Yeah, probably I'd maybe make it about a 5% chance of hitting that. Mm. Possibly, possibly. Or, you know, I mean, I wouldn't even sit there rolling that many dice, to be honest. I'd probably just every now and then go, yeah, I think now is the time. <laughs> yeah, you okay. can play it that way. I was kind of playing it to where factoring in also the maneuvering of the player characters, trying to get a better shot at the creature, stuff ah, like that. So, yes. so yeah. um, other than that, it's just a big, nasty bug. So... I mean, this looks a little bit like a praying mantis, the way they've drawn yeah. it in here. Yeah, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice picture of it. You know, some of uh, Tramp's uh, cooler works, I think. So, does it have a? What's uh, is a number of appearing only one, or did you only picked one? Uh, generally, one to six. One to six. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, th- so you th- could have like a whole bunch of these things of varying hit dice. Yeah. Okay. Probably have like a leader and a bunch of uh, younger ones or something. Uh, I'd probably give the hit dice, you know, be like the older ones are bigger and more hit dice and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I like about what you're saying is whenever you're talking about pulling up a monster, you know, you don't have to uh, say just because you've got 
a high level group that they can't go up against lizard men for example you could, lizard man doesn't have to be two hit dice and onkeg doesn't have to be three hit dice you know you can go in here and start messing with these things oh yeah oh sure you know and i think it's a really good way when you're dming uh to kind of th- mix it up with your players because they see something coming up and they say well you know that's not going to be a big deal that's just a you know it's just a giant ant yeah what's a giant ant right. going to do to me well this is a special one you know and yeah. with the on keg it kind of encourages that right off the bat anywhere from three to eight hit dice you don't have any idea what you're going up against exactly it, it like you said it keeps a bit of uh, it keeps it the players on their toes a little bit because they're not yeah. sure how tough this creature actually is when they run into it mm-hmm yeah, and when players start doing the whole, you know, you start describing something, they're like, kobolds. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's when you want to be like, ah, these are actually 14 hit dice kobolds with psionic powers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. We're going to, yeah, we're going to, we're going to juice them up and throw them at you. Yeah. Yeah. And I've done that. Or, oh, well, believe me, I've done that to players. Vince, you remember you were saying about doing that with a beholder once. <laughs> going the other way around, so yeah, I made it a little tiny, like one inch creature. <laughs> <laughs> Fooled the players entirely. They were like, "What?" Hey, never said. Works both ways. Yes, it does. Yep, All I've right. also made one-eyed red uh, <laughs> hobgoblins that explode. One-eyed one. so <laughs> oh, explode. <laughs> yeah, wow. the, when they die, there was a seventy percent chance that they would explode. That's cool. Nice. Yeah. Because I'm evil. <laughs> Very evil. Yes. You're quasi-evil. <laughs> All right. So uh, that'd be kind of cool. Do we have any other... Was was the tactics that you used something you just came up with out of nowhere or... Well, you know, being an insect uh, or... Uh, yeah, I guess it, what you could classify this as an insect. I don't know. I just... I played it as just any sort of creature who's trying to defend what it considers its lair. Who's to say that this was the only one? There could have been others out there, too. So, Okay, cool. Well, um, just let's hear how some other people out there do it. I think we described it enough. We gave a little bit of a tactic. We went over it really briefly. I mean, we're not going to, you know, beat the dead horse. You can just flip open the monster manual. Or the dead ank egg. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Shh. And Sorry. you can look at it yourself, <laughs> Nick, with the bad, bad joke. And uh, <laughs> we're going to head into our next segment of the night. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world. I like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. So if we were actually going in order tonight, like I should have done for the notes, <laughs> this is where the creature feature should have been. And... This is where now the table matters is. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, it doesn't matter. No big deal. Yeah, you know. We're and, free-forming it. Yeah, we're free-forming yeah, it th- today. This time around, table matters is on page 43. Yeah, yes. we pushed it back this week. Anyway, yeah. we have a... Like we talked about in the past, uh, actually it was a Jason and I only show how to play a thief. We're going to talk about how to play a cleric this week. Yeah. So the first topic of playing a cleric is what is a cleric? No, I'm kidding. You don't need to know that. <laughs> first, well, it's your secretary, obviously. Yes. Yeah. No, it's not your secretary. <laughs> what are the it's different the clerical types from Isn't, the clerical pool? You just lost fifty experience points. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> What's the different types of clerics to play? And I'm saying cleric, and not clerk or anything. Some people say clerk. Well, since you're bringing it up, clerk is just a derivative of the word cleric. I mean, these are all the same basic things. You know, in our own words, these come from the the monks that were originally in the scriptoriums, which is why you have, you know, a secretary who could then eventually be the typist. It's all the same kind of thing. That bag of groceries. Is a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good point because it brings up, well, what what is a cleric based on? Why are we saying cleric instead of priest or monk? You know, because there is a monk yeah. in, in AD&D. Um, there's even you know a druid. So why why is this the cleric? And you know there's a lot of different ways that people play what they're meant to be. Um, whether they're supposed to be uh, modeled on medieval uh, religious orders, or whether they're supposed to be modeled more on medieval uh, uh, battle orders. You know, like the Knights Templar or something yes. like that. And you know everybody has a different take on it. Right. Yeah. But there are so, some there are some kind of standards that most people think of when they play a cleric. Like, for example, you said a battle type cleric. There's mm-hmm. also the healer type cleric, and there's also mm-hmm. the mix. 
and then there's more of the buffing type cleric. So, see, now I don't make any distinctions there. Well, it's interesting pe- that you say that. Like I, do I don't that. really make the distinction. Yeah, I don't make the distinctions either. I, I at know, least I try not to. Uh, yeah, I know quite a few people that'll walk into the cleric class and be like, "All right, this guy is going to be a straight healer, like uh, Record of Lotos, for example." Nick, you've mm-hmm. seen that. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, I can't think of the guy's name offhand, but he was just a straight up uh, priest of, uh, or I should say, cleric of. Um, I forget the name of the goddess, but all he did was heal, and he stayed in the mm-hmm. background. You could play someone like that. He never really yeah, battled. Right. So, see, I right off the bat, that feels like a, a a different game to me a little bit. That feels like talking about the game as a, uh, you know, what's the role of this piece on the board? And I don't. I think if one of my players, if, I, if they were doing that, I'd try to push them towards role playing a little bit differently. Now, okay. if you got a cleric who's got a strength of eight, mm-hmm. and you know, I uh, actually can a cleric. I, I sh- I'm Nine, sounding like an idiot. Nine. I don't. I don't even know if they're able to have a strength of eight if they can go that low and still be a cleric. <laughs> I think uh, yes, they can. I think it's only. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just wisdom, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no other. It's a wisdom, yeah. It's a wisdom. Yeah, it's the yeah, minimum wisdom of, I believe, nine. Yeah, nine. Okay, just making sure I'm not being a total fool. Okay. Uh, but, you know, if you've got a cleric who's got a terrible strength and, uh, you know, maybe their constitution is low and they just wouldn't survive in a fight and they're, you know, they're lousy at it, sure. Maybe they really focus on their spell casting and on their healing and that type of stuff. But right. I'd still have them uh, – I'd still expect them to fight. Well, yeah, they, they could still fight, right. but – I don't see what's wrong with going into your game saying, "All right, this is this is what I rolled. Uh, I'm going to put this lesser stats into my combat stats and more into my intelligence and wisdom and charisma." And if I'm going to DM be, lets you roll that way. Oh, uh, depending, right? However, <laughs> right? Depending on how your DM lets you roll. Yeah. And uh, let's just say you roll it up to you want to be a healer. You're like I want to be just a healer type, the talking type, but I will, you know, battle if I have to by throwing using a sling or something. Or, sure. Throwing sure. a, yeah, a rock. Yeah, you know, I, I guess that kind of makes sense in terms of the uh, the personality and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And if we're talking about it like yeah. personality, all right. But uh, if somebody if if somebody says I'm going to be doing a battle cleric, okay, you know, at that point I'm going to be like, you know what? Maybe you want to be a fighter because yeah. you're well. No. Here, here's it. It could be a little bit different. I for me, this is actually one of my favorite classes to play. Right. I've had mm-hmm. a lot of time to play the cleric. Right. And I thought a lot about how other people, you know, and seen how other people play it. You know, people just play them as the medic because that's <laughs> right. all they think that they're capable of doing. Medic. Other people play them like as, you know, the fighting priest. Right, battle uh, cleric. Um, you know, but but the one thing that I think a lot of people forget, and and I think this comes with a lot of the. The, the studying on, on our history, our, our actual history, at least in medieval history and and such, is one of the things that they should be doing is spreading their faith. Right. Yes. Yeah. They and that's they, one they, of the things that that I think is missed by many players when they play a cleric is I I think it's all three of those things. If if you play all three of those things. In a certain fashion, say, proselytizing about your faith, healing those and giving aid to those in your party or others, and also, when the time comes to it, lending aid in battle in whatever way possible. It might not yep. necessarily be combat, but True. it could be in some other fashion. And I, I'm kind of vague in those in those three because I think it really... Depends on what type of god, yeah, or group of gods your cleric is a is a follower of. You know, say for example, you know, if you're playing a cleric that's uh, worshiping um, Odin, Odin, okay, mm-hmm. uh, yep. You know, let's go with let's go with that. Okay, uh, pretty commonly known god within the game, and you know, Norse mythos, and you know, he's the head of the uh, Norse mythology. Um, I would say for a cleric like that, you would probably be a lot in the combat and a, quite a bit into proselytizing about your faiths, but not so much into the healing. Uh, doesn't mean that you won't, but you're. I, there's certain emphasis, that I think, depending on which god you, you might worship, 
Yes. Uh, what that would yeah help and, flesh your character out more. I'd like to. Take... And you know, it doesn't just have to be a personality thing there. No, no. Right. It can be the spells they're given. Yeah. So exactly. I mean, you 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 nailed it on the head that the. The number one thing, however you're playing your cleric, if you go in there with a weakling or a smarty or a toughy or whatever, number one, you must be serving a deity. You're there for a purpose. The only reason you get your spells is so that you can do that deity's desire, I guess, on the, yeah. on the prime material plane. Right. Think and of, if you're not doing it, you're going to lose. Think of a, a perfect example. I'll use a movie. Think about Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. Mm-hmm. All those guys in uh, in Italy that had the symbol on their chest and they were following around um, Indiana Jones trying to stop him, but then they were end up helping him towards the end. They would just mm-hmm. think of them as like battle clerks running around spreading the word of God and their order. That would be what a battle clerk would probably be doing. Mm-hmm. So there's a good example right there. Um, so if I, yeah, Jason. I was just oh okay. Good. Go Nick? I don't know when you guys started. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, one of the things I think also to make the cleric and to be a little bit more enjoyable to play, yeah. Because I, I I've seen on polls like on Dragon's Foot, like a, 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 between the four core four classes or all the subclasses, cleric is somewhere near the bottom. Yeah, it is. Which I don't get. I don't get either. Which I don't get either. Because I mean, uh, you've got you got a character here who is got some great fighting powers you know can yep. really get in there and mix it up in a battle who's got sure. some amazing spells to be casting tons of fun can use a lot of different magic items has scrolls that they can read has yep, right. all kinds of great little uh, things they can get up to and is amazingly fun to role play because you've got you got a hook anytime you want you just pull out the yeah, old serving exactly. my deity card yep I mean if you look at it just by the numbers wise as far as fighting capacity the cleric is second to the fighter. I mean, mm-hmm. it's more powerful than the magic user and thief. Yep. I mean, if you're just talking about the core four classes. Yeah. I mean, and they're also talking about a character class that can cast spells and still wear armor. Okay. Without so penalties. So how good of a deal is that? And they don't get so, the penalties for wearing the armor either. Exactly. Exactly. And this is and, where I get into like even fleshing the care the cleric class out more is one of the things. I'm going to do in my new campaign Uh-oh. and 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 I've done this in the past and I think it works really well it makes the cleric a little bit more uh, enticing the play mm-hmm. is and I and I borrowed this from other games too and I think this might have come up from later editions but I think it works in first edition is one of the things is giving the um, the cleric a weapon of choice based on what their god uses. Yeah, that came I, in, yes. That came in second edition, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I, like I think that. it makes sense though. It, you and know, it I mean, does. You're, you're talking about second edition, but I'm looking here at an article from 1984 by Gary Gygax mm-hmm. uh, called Clerics Live by Other Rules. And yeah. he goes in, he starts getting into these things, and I think it's a great way to think about the cleric. And he's talking about, uh, I, I have to go back and look and see if he's specifically talking about that weapon, but it would certainly fit the spirit of the article, which is that if you have a deity who's predisposed to one type of uh, thing or another, they're going to have spells that they're more interested in giving and less interested in giving. So mm-hmm. a deity who is a uh, a water god is not going to probably... Uh, respond to any prayers for um, what's the opposite of fire. create water? Fire. Destroy no, no, the opposite water. of create water. Yeah, that's Destroy that's water. Reversible. Oh, that's okay. reversible one, yeah. right? Um, yeah. You know, they're probably not going to do that. Evil, evil deities are not going to want you to have protection from evil. Good ones aren't going to want you to have protection from good. So, when you pray for your spells, some of them are going to get refused. And on the other side, maybe there's some some gods who really want to grant favor in a certain way, uh, either because that god is more powerful or they're, they really think their cleric has an important task to perform. And so they might even give that first-level cleric a third-level spell just for this one time. Mm-hmm. It's a very sure. important moment. Now, I do remember, uh, now that you mentioned Dragon Magazine, there was an article pre-second edition that someone did on specialized, uh, you know, special weapons for clerics based on their gods. I'm trying to remember what issue it was, but it was for first edition. Somebody did it out there. Obviously, it's not canon to the game as far as the regular rules, but you know, someone already thought of it back then, and it can mm-hmm. be done. Also, you could even go as far as armor, too, if you wanted to. I mean, 
you know, obviously a, a cleric of Odin, they could probably wear wherever they want. But if you're a cleric of, say, I don't know, Aphrodite, hmm. you think that cleric is going to be allowed by their by their church or their temple? Maybe they frown upon heavy armors or armor at all. So maybe Odin kind of, does too, because maybe it's yeah cowardly to wear it. Actually, uh, yeah. that's a good example because there is some novels uh, from the Forgotten Realms era that. Um, one of the clerics in the book, I uh, can't rename, I think his Aiden was his name. He was a cleric of Soon, and he did not wear armor. He only wore very fancy robes and always tried to look his best because that's what the goddess wanted. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. a perfect, I believe that was his name. I'm sorry if I'm quoting it wrong, but that's what it was. So there's your perfect example right there. I think is you're trying to make the cleric class more enticing by having all these other added things to it, you know? Maybe there's certain weapons with your god, certain armors, and like Jason suggested, maybe a certain type of spells. And I think that just makes it a lot more interesting to play. And it maybe adds a little bit of motivation into to playing a cleric as well. I mean, just going off for our example as Odin, you know, maybe the choice of weapon for Odin is like maybe a basher's sword or a spear Axe. And you're, or the or the battle axe, you know, maybe uh, because of that, your your cleric does gets a plus one bonus to hit with the uh, those weapons, and they can use any type of armor uh, as far as that class is concerned, or you know, make it however you want. So, I'm I am keen to using that for the yeah. uh, the cleric instead, of just like you know, playing. Yeah, you know, the generic player, cleric who worships the god Genericus. <laughs> Genericus, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, the you... shield has a has a barcode on it or something like cool. that. Cool. So... That'd be a cool god to make up. Anyway, um, so you guys have no objections with letting a cleric have a bladed weapon? Yes, I do. Oh, go on, Jason. Express. Absolutely. No, they, that, that's there's some points where you have to remember we are playing a game, right? And uh, I'll be the first one to speak out against things like game balance and you know proper encounters and all that sort of silliness but you know if you start giving clerics swords and uh, axes and such then you're really stepping into paladin territory as far as I'm concerned you know you might as well just play a paladin Mm. Um, Uh, I don't think so because you're not getting the special abilities of a paladin well okay fair but but uh, you know, one of the one of the flavors of a cleric is that they're out there using only blunt weapons. Because even though the clerics are uh, spreading the faith, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, sure, evil gods and different deities and everything. The, the the general idea at the beginning of it all was that they'd be out there doing the fighting just to show some might, but they're really supposed to be spreading the faith. And that going out and drawing blood and deliberately acting like a warrior uh, just meant that you were behaving like some other class. Now, So an Odin of Thor, uh, a cleric uh, of but, Thor would not act in a manner that's... I'm not that's... saying they wouldn't. I'm not saying they wouldn't. I'm not saying that I know all that. I can think of all the rationale why this wouldn't be, but... If I'm going to the priest in battle kind of thing, uh, you know, if if I'm watching MASH and Father Mulcahy picks up a machine gun, it's <laughs> just not, you know, it doesn't make <laughs> a lot of sense to me anymore. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> but, 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 but ultimately, I mean, the thing is, at some point I have funny. to look at this and say, it says right here in the rule book that clerics don't use edged weapons. Right. And, I've used I've even used that as an example of a silly rule that I follow anyway because sure a mace is quite likely to have spikes on the end and you know what's the difference between hitting somebody with a ball with spikes and stabbing them with a sword but I just I'm going to follow the rules because it's the way it's set up it seems to work well that way well if you don't do that you got chaos you got cats if, living with dogs it's just uh, living no. together <laughs> you know what I I have to disagree because I I just don't think it'll if you're talking about a balance issue I just don't think it'll be that unbalancing. Well, I'm not talking about balance. I'm just talking about a rule that's always been there, and it feels weird to watch a cleric pull out a sword, and that's not AD and D to me. So I don't do it. Well, that came along with uh, Second Edition when they had that uh, when the gods were able to grant the 
the clerk spe- well they're priests by second edition special abilities and special this and that and they can do the special domains and that's when it just started getting all wacky in my opinion like Jason said you well, stick that's to the what basic I mean, yeah I mean we should go like I, I guess what I'm saying is is kind of like what second edition did but not so much that it got out of hand you know I guess somehow tone it down a bit all right, I'm so. gonna I'm gonna go back to 1980 here. I'm just gonna pull out an article called "No oh. Swords Means No Swords." I thought you were gonna do a time warp. Let's do the time warp again. Oh, sorry. Now it's 1980. <laughs> it might actually be 1979. I'd have to check, but it's Dragon Number 33. Just Short little thing by Lawrence Huss. Not canon, but it's nice to read. And uh, he says it's the club mace and flail are but growths of the staff, which stands for guidance and religious authority. Though the end result of the sword stroke and the well-aimed mace blow are the same, the symbolic intent differs. As the high power judges our acts, much from a viewpoint in which symbols supersede particulars, this symbolic difference is of greatest importance. In lay terms, okay, uh, the use of edged or pointed weapons has a different theological potency than the use of non-edged ones. Gods, as differentiated from nature deified, tend to desire blood spilled by their servants only under certain highly ritualized circumstances, such as sacrifices and oath swearings. As a result, when a cleric uses a forbidden weapon type and hits, he becomes ritually polluted and loses all ability to use clerical skills and spells. So what I get out of that is kind of good. You know, the, the, the idea of you might have these ritual sacrifices where you pull out the dagger mm-hmm. and you do certain things because you're in that moment. And if you do that same uh, thing, if you, if you act like you would in a ritual sacrifice when you're in a profane battle or a mundane, you know, non-sacred uh, ritual moment, it's like blaspheming. So, sure, go ahead and do it, but you're going to lose your spells. You're not going to be able to... Uh, you're going to lose the favor of your god unless there's some real serious reason why you just had to do had to blaspheme. So, I disagree with the article. No, you Ooh. can disagree with it. I'm just saying. <laughs> and here, and I'll, but I'll give you I'll give you a reason why. Okay. The reason why is what if your cleric does worship a god of war, and that well, god of it? war, part of being a cleric of the god of war is to go out and experience combat and to experience... Why can't they experience with a blunt weapon? Why do they have to have yeah. an edged weapon? It's the same I thing. I can't see why you couldn't use it. Why? I, what's the... Re- yeah, okay, so you want to experience combat, but why does he have to experience it with an edged weapon? Yeah. Isn't the whole purpose of being a cleric is you're supposed to be... Uh, you're supposed to spread the word of your god, but also you're supposed to be doing it... Maybe in- your god is very bloodthirsty. I'm just uh, here's saying. the thing. is The know. cleric is a sacred class. Yeah. The cleric is supposed to be a conduit to the gods. And so there's certain things that the cleric does that are just different. Just like the magic user has to have access to the world of spells through certain things that True. he does, the cleric has to have access to his god. Okay. And so it means he has to do certain very sacred rituals. Right. And if he starts doing things in the profane world that are uh, just like that, Mm-hmm. Then it's that's why I'm saying it's like blaspheming. It's like blaspheming through action, right? So, which is a perfect segue into the last topic of this issue here. Uh, when your deity cuts you off, yeah, like Jason said, blasphemy and type things. How would you guys handle that like, through role playing? Or are you just one of those mm, when your deity cuts you off, it doesn't work? I'm gonna go through. Mm. I'm gonna go through the role play aspect and try to act it out. And that's nice. I like it. I like saying, like, you, like I, I cast Bless and be like, well, you feel the energy of your God coming to you, but then you realize inside your head, for such and such actions you did before, your deity is not granting you this spell at this time. Yeah, maybe you actually have visions when you, after you do your prayers that tell you what's happening. Nightmares? Nightmares. Um, some type oh, yeah. of a, a sign is sent from the heavens, you know, mm-hmm. and that would be really good. What's, what would be a different symbol that would be appropriate for each one? So maybe if you, let's say you worship... Um, Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths. Okay. That the symbol that's sent to you somehow is a uh, a young blacksmith's apprentice comes and is speaking in tongues before you, and that's how you find out. Or um, what's the matter with you, boy? Yeah. <laughs> or I, uh, you know, let's let's well, let's not get into Cthulhu. But uh, <laughs> well, what the heck? Let's say you're a, you're a cleric of Shagath. Ooh. You know, some great nightmares could come to 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 show you what's happening there. Um, 
Um, yeah, let's say you're time. you're you're worshiping. I'm, I'm as you can tell, I'm like jumping around through the deities yeah, and yeah. my God book right now. But uh, now I'm looking at um, Kuan Yin, the goddess of mercy and childbearing. So now the visions are going to come somehow through a, a midwife or a young mother or a baby. You know, you could you could really play it up. You're pregnant. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> goddess, I've done, very I've big done character. stuff similar to that in. Uh, one the one I think in the uh, Salt Marsh campaign. Okay, mm-hmm. we've done something very similar to that. Not necessarily that they were losing their, uh, that they were losing certain contact with their god, but their god would contact them through dreams. Mm-hmm. And I played up the dreams as I forget what the the person's god was, but I, but he was like, I played him kind of like a. You know, kind of like a you know wise guy kind of like thing. The god he hey, fucked like this, like you I'm know? Joe Pesci or something, huh? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So I played him like that. He was like some god of thievery or stealth or something like that. So I kind of played him up like that in the dream. It's like you see Joe Pesci. Oh, and he's talking to you like this, you know. So yeah. No, and that's some of the fun things being a DM when you when you can put those images yeah, into the player's head and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know my my god was like this, but I'll okay, that's cool. You know? I'm worshiping Joe Pesci. <laughs> yes. Which version? The casino version or <laughs> the Goodfellas version? Yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely Goodfellas version. Uh, even better, your your <laughs> your deity is William Shatner, the Star Trek One William Shatner, or the Star god Trek God of Overacting. <laughs> yeah. Your I would cleric. have my deity be the uh, Priceline negotiator, William Shatner, actually. That would be a good one. Uh, He'd probably have a high charisma at that point, right? I'm hey, not hey. going to give you that spell. <laughs> I'm but, not but going now, to give you that spell. You can do the... See, I can't do impersonations. I don't even try. Yeah, uh, you're good at Spunk. it. <laughs> but But I don't think it has to be even something uh, as mystical as a vision every time. Danny Crane. Because, you know, a lot of times it's just going to be the other... The, either the players themselves or if they're not picking up quickly enough, you know, have the NPCs do it, but just be completely shocked at the cleric's behavior and just let them know by the way that they're looking at them. Like, did you really just do that? I kind of <laughs> like the old uh, Monty Python thing when the guy, the God looks through the cloud and is like, no, yes. <laughs> one of those things. Stop you that could. groveling. Stop that. Stop the that. The thing I can't stand is groveling. Actually, I have to retract that. I want to pick the William Shatner from TJ Hooker days as my God. Okay, I don't okay. even know. I don't remember what he even okay. said on that show. <laughs> Nothing. I've he mixed, just, he in was my just memory, cool. I've mixed it up with Hawaii Five-0 and Dragnet. I don't even remember. Just think of Shatner in, in a uniform with his gut sticking out running around. I do that every day. All right, cool. I think of that all the time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were mentioning, we were mentioning uh, uh, blasphemy and that kind of stuff, and it got me thinking about a book that I read a while back about uh, the history of swearing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because the, the idea that the words that we use now for swear words um, as being so harsh and words that are, you know, scatological in nature or sexual or whatever, those really were not the big swear words. That's very recent. It's only in the past yeah. maybe 100, 150 years. You go back any farther than that, and it was all religious. You know, if you really wanted to say something terrible, you just invoked a, a religious term. You know, if you went to the Old West, you know, when they showed Deadwood on HBO, they had to change the way everybody swore because if they actually did it, it would have sound silly. Yeah. People would have yeah. just, you know, said something uh, uh, blasphemous and it would have been the biggest thing. And so naturally, if a, if a priest did it, you know, everybody would completely fall over. There was a, a, a member of parliament in, in, in Britain that was actually removed from his post for swearing. Wow. He was he wow. was kicked out of Parliament because he went around and he used to say he used to just say things like I swear to God this was a wonderful steak, you know or whatever you know I said that was a meal fit for Jehovah. Don't <gasps> he said it. Throw the stones. <laughs> you know, but that's all I real... said was a meal fit for Jehovah. Now but, they're saying but, it. But, but, <laughs> you know, so so if your if your cleric is doing things that the actions are just as blasphemous, well then everybody else is going to. Do probably react just like that, and they won't even have to get a vision. They'll know by all the townspeople who just stared in horror at what they just did. Yeah, good, good call, good call. Mm. All so right. be a cleric. Be a cleric. Play it up. It's a man's <laughs> life in the clerical army. Yes, <laughs> the clerical pool. I'd like to know on TV when they started loosening up the rules so people can actually start saying things. I mean, I yeah, I know you were you said you were in marketing, Jason. Well, when did they Mash- be- 
MASH was actually one of the first things. There was an episode of MASH in... Don't say any uh, of the words, but you know what I'm talking no, about. No, I won't say the words, but um, there was an episode of MASH in one of the last seasons when Alan Alda was directing and writing it, and um, he wanted to say... He wanted to call somebody an SOB, but, okay. you know, s- spell it out and really say it. Yeah, yeah. And there's, they were not going to let that through, and he had to actually argue the point that it had such... Uh, emotional importance and impact that it was the only way that they could get that across and they sat with the censors and they finally said okay this one time you can actually say that yeah and it was a big moment i remember when it aired and what a kind of shocking moment it was in television and uh you know with with every year since it's just sort of denigrated until you got to the point where you had the south park episode where they were saying (laughs) oh you know whatever oh yeah 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 yeah, that's true but what was it? I remember the big event back in the eighties was the Golden Girls when they said the B word to one another. Mm-hmm. That yeah, was and, that, and that they wouldn't have been able to say that if it hadn't been for Alan Alda yeah. uh, getting away with it on Mash. And uh, you know, there was a point. I don't know if uh, you know anybody can even say a, a, a religious sort of a you know, gee, damn it, you know, like spell that whole thing out. I mean, there's that's it's, actually an acceptable term for radio and TV since nineteen ninety. So, um, so clerics shouldn't do that. Yeah. All right, cool. We'll and they that. should not have swords. <laughs> well, um, you know, you just had to throw that last little jab in there. Ah, oh, but you can't jab because you're using I wasn't a mace. Jabbing. That was yeah, I know, because you're using a mace. Children. Just Children. Let's, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, wow. Let's go into our last segment, boys. Last okay. fever. <laughs> One of those electronic voting dealies. You two are such children. <laughs> Our last segment of the Dude, night. Dude, we're talking about a game with fairies and dragons in it. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So our last topic. Fairies and dragons, okay? <laughs> Nick, you lost 50 experience points, too. No! <laughs> anyway, so uh, we put up a new poll on the website. This one uh, I thought was kind of interesting. What type of game do you enjoy the most to play? Uh, I put down a couple options, and you guys should uh, vote too. Uh, option number one is Jason, you probably vote like four times knowing you somehow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a long epic campaign with maps and props. Level 36, here I come, baby. Why well, didn't put the baby part? Uh, a short campaign, same characters. Uh, a pickup game with no obligations. That sounds like a date somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> I gotta change that. I don't like to play, I just like to read the books and tell others how they should play. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Let's number all vote for that one. No, number one uh, uh, leading in the poll right now with sixty three percent is a long epic campaign with maps, props, and level thirty six. Here I come. That's what I picked too. What do you guys yeah. uh, think, Nick? Yeah, that's one I picked as well. I mean, I like a long epic campaign. What can I say? Yeah. I mean, a short one isn't so bad, but I mean, it just you just <laughs> build up a lot more story with the longer one. Yeah, it's I like, just I much think, more fun. I, I think like I probably more. would vote for the short campaign, actually, because, you know, there's no reason you can't return to it later and do things, but it's nice to wrap up some loose ends within a couple of months or, you know, maybe six months at the but most. But you can only mark your ballot with a crayon because you're a cleric. You can't use a pen. Oh, right. we're edge, leaking edge over pen. segments now. Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> the... Uh, but, you know, I mean, define long, epic, and short. I would say long, epic is probably something that takes three or four years at least. I, I love, love hearing a story, sitting down, and then someone be like, oh, dude, I just finished a six-year campaign, and my cleric was level 35, and we went through the mountain. I just love, I love listening to those stories. I don't know about you guys, but I do. Oh, I love listening oh, to them. Yeah, I'm just thinking, cool you know, like with the campaigns that I'm starting right now, I expect them to run for probably about, you know, six months, at least to get through the story arc. Not necessarily, not saying the campaign's going to end, but I like a story arc that can at least be tied up. Yeah, that's something to talk about in a future episode: uh, campaigns and story arcs, as opposed to just winging it every week. So there's another little topic for us to talk about. All right, yay, cool. And uh, RFI's RFI Podcast dot com, RFI uh, Staff at Gmail dot com. Well, that's going to put another wrap on the show. It's been a fun week. We're going to be it's heading been cool. Yeah. This was a little short show only. <laughs> right, Jason? Short show, right? Yeah, we were going to do a short show. We did a regular one. Yeah, well, we yeah. we love you people, so we decided to do a Sure short we show. do. Why not? Well, Keep I listening, do. please. Keep listening. Keep downloading. Keep supporting. 
Uh, go to the website. Comment on the articles. We appreciate that. Come go on Dragon's Foot. D20 Radio want, likes your uh, your comments, too. A lot of people have been commenting on there about certain things. Want and you head to... over to the deadgamesociety.com. Yes. Sign oh, up, yeah. Uh, DGsociety.com, as we are uh, an official member of Dead Game Society. Yay! They have their nice little forums there, and they've actually went and took my suggestion and color-coded people for like certain things that they do. So it's kind of neat. So if you got a ring, Jason, when you sign up, you get a special color code now. Excellent. You can be a special person. Excellent. excellent. Well, I've always yes. been told I was. Well, I didn't well, think that's what they said excellent. when I had to get on the short bus, anyway. Wow. And with that, that explains a lot. Yeah. And with <laughs> yeah. those thoughts, we're going to leave this week by saying keep it original, keep it old school, and keep your cleric with blunt weapons. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Woohoo! Roll for initiative.